Can you see my screen? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Professor Reddy, for this invitation, and I really appreciate also uh, this initiative of creating uh, the international webinar series on geoenvironmental engineering, and I'm honored to be part of it. So thank you for the invitation and for the presentation. Um, I. I was asked to highlight the reasons why I think geoenvironmental engineering is important and to tackle some important challenges for the new geoenvironmental engineers. And in particular, with the aim in mind of talking about environmental protection and sustainability. Um, so why geoenvironmental engineering is important to me, uh, the, its interdisciplinarity is uh, very important. As Professor already mentioned in one of uh, his uh, seminars, in fact, uh, all the aspects of uh, geotechnics are applied for the geoenvironmental engineering um, purposes and also other uh, from uh, uh, um, from other uh, disciplines. So the cooperation between the different disciplines is uh, crucial and uh, it is very challenging the environmental engineering for these reasons because uh, we have to know several aspects of uh, uh, geology, uh, chemistry, uh, geotechnics, uh, engineering. Um, and above all, uh, another reason why it's important is the practical interest. For environmental protection, protection and sustainability, uh, it is uh, important uh, this uh, series of webinars uh, to raise awareness on uh, and also to talk about the current challenges. Uh, for this reason, I would like to talk on the use of polymerized clays and waste materials for various geoenvironmental uh, engineering uh, applications. Um, in particular, I would like to talk about uh, the problem of uh, spreading pollution from waste site and uh, landfills through to the soil surrounding soil and groundwater. For this reason, uh, to isolate the waste or polluted sites, normally, um, normally um, um, clay barriers are used. This kind of barriers were already introduced by uh, different uh, speakers uh, in this series of webinars. For example, Professor uh, Sampol Lord, uh, Nasli Yesilar, Benson, and, uh, and Reddy. So I refer also to their presentation that was uh, taken more also on the uh, from a general point of view. In this presentation, I will go more in particular uh, on the engineering, on the treatment of the clay uh, to protect the environment. Uh, this type of treatment was also tackled by Professor Benson on a particular material that I will also mention here. And I will mention also another type of treatments of uh, uh, the same clay. What is the problem for clay? The clay uh, is very good when it is permeated with uh, water. In fact, around every clay particle that is here represented by the black uh, line, uh, a gel formed by water and ions is formed. This gel is uh, immobile and uh, create uh, a um, an uh, immobile gel and create also a particular structure of the clay that we will see later. Unfortunately, in contact with the pollutants, the clay changes its structure and become aggregated. Let's see what is the effect on the uh, protection of the environment. When the clay is contact with water, like you can see at the uh, left, the Diffuse double layer, with this, which is this blue cloud around the clay platelet, is jelly and immobile, and the structure of the clay is dispersed. Therefore, there, is, there are very torse towards and long flow paths for the pollutant to leave the waste disposal. Uh, and this is good. We have a low permeability, which is what we want. On the other side, when we, uh, when the clay is in contact with a, a pollution uh, solution from the landfill or uh, the waste uh, disposal uh, or the uh, polluted site, the clay become aggregated. 
when there is in particular, for example, exchange between ions like calcium into the solution and the sodium into the clay, the structure become aggregated and the flow path, uh, paths, they increase suddenly, increasing the permeability, which is what we don't want. For this reason, uh, during my PhD, I studied uh, the possibility to uh, engineer these clays to improve the, its uh, protection against chemical attack. Uh, what I did is I started from uh, literature. So one of the oldest uh, type of clay I have seen in the literature were the organoclays. The organoclays are treated with quaternary ammonium groups. Uh, they were studied by Professor Burns in the States and uh, her, uh, her group, uh, in particular also by Professor Bate Bate, and they studied the possibility to use uh, this clay for several applications, among others also the protection against organic uh, molecules into the uh, polluted solutions. And in that case, uh, these uh, kind of clays, they work very well. Uh, they were also mixed to uh, permeable reactive barriers for vertical walls, uh, again, very efficiently, very efficiently to uh, retain organic molecules. On the other hand, the hydraulic conductivity was not uh, uh, decreased uh, um, when permeated with the solutions. Uh, therefore, I pass also to, uh, to, other, uh, to study other um, bentonites. For, for example, the multiswellable bentonite, which was uh, created in Japan. Um, it consists of a clay treated with propylene carbonate, which is an organic molecule that induces osmotic swelling. Um, I recall the presentation of Professor Sampol Lord. She mentioned, she uh, explained the difference between crystalline and osmotic swelling. So I don't, I will not go in detail on that explanation. However, I will mention that every clay has a crystalline uh, swelling. So this. Uh, gel, uh, this swollen diffuse double layer, which is, uh, which can arrive also to higher levels of swelling, like uh, osmotic swelling, when the clay is particularly good uh, performing. Uh, the propylene carbonate induces osmotic swelling, creating a protection against chemical attack. Uh, this uh, multiswellable bentonite was studied by several authors, Professor Katsumi, also uh, Mazzieri and ourselves in Belgium, and also in the United States, Professor Malusis. And indeed, uh, it was always demonstrated that this uh, clay was uh, particularly good, efficient. On the other hand, uh, there were some uh, limitations, like for example, it was too costly, uh, indeed, it is not now um, in the market, but also it was demonstrated that there was a possible uh, illusion of the uh, treatment um, demonstrated by chemical osmotics tests that I will show later, but also by wet and uh, dry aging performed in Italy. Another um, polymerized material is the trisoplast. The trisoplast is a material developed in the Netherlands. It, it consists of a mixture of sand, bentonite, and polymer. And uh, this mixture was mixed dry. I highlight this because in this presentation, I will talk about the treatment methods. And in this case, the material was mixed dry. Uh, this material is normally used for compacted clay liners that normally are one meter thick, but trisoplast um, producers claim that they can uh, have a compacted clay liner of 30 centimeter uh, thickness. Um, in this way, they create more volume available for waste, which has an environmental, but also economical impact. On the other hand, the dry mixing can lead to dilution of the polymer. Let's see other products. Uh, the DPH GCL, what, which was also studied uh, broadly uh, worldwide by Professor Benson and Kolstad, uh, but also by Mazzieri, by ourselves in Belgium, by also by uh, the American uh, group like uh, Malusis. So this DPH GCL developed in the UK has three different method treatment. Polymer treatment, prehydration, and densification. In our field, it's very well known that prehydration improves the protection of the clay, but only temporarily. As it was shown uh, by uh, Shackelford, uh, this uh, improvement uh, 
last until all the ions uh, diffuse into the clay. I will show more details later about this. The other method is polymer treatment. In this case, the mixture of clay and polymer solution was mixed in wet conditions, differently from trisoplast that was dry mixing. And then the mixture of clay and polymer is densified. As you can see here above at the right, the densification produce, produces a compaction of the clay of the DPH GCL, dense prehydrated. Dense is because this um, densification uh, or through calendaring under vacuum produces this uh, structure with very long flow paths and very um, limited uh, pores. So the porosity decreases incredibly. And this is what claimed uh, is claimed by the producers, by the patent of this product. Um, the polymers used in that product are uh, different. It's not only one polymer, but there are uh, two main types, that is carboxypentyl cellulose and polyacrylates, but also methanol. The mixture is uh, chemically um, treated for several purposes, like against uh, microbes, uh, against uh, um, uh, to improve the workability of the product. So the main reason they claim the improvement was the densification, prehydration and densification. Another product studied uh, in, the, in particular in the States by the group uh, of uh, Benson and, and also Professor uh, Scalia and uh, Bonoff. They studied this product that consists of a treatment of a clay with acrylic acid that is first intercalated and then uh, polymerized within the clay platelets. Um, this product also shows a very low hydraulic conductivity, even high chemicosmotic efficiency. Uh, however, it was shown that uh, the polymer uh, gel, it is eluted. It was shown in a test uh, uh, in the laboratory that uh, it is like a chewing gum that eludes uh, out of the clay. Therefore, it was demonstrated that very probably the reason of the improvement of the behavior is due to clogging. Uh, and this was indeed uh, one of the difference between this type of uh, bentonite polymer uh, nanocomposite and other products. At uh, Hent University, we developed uh, hyperclays. Hyperclay is a, a methodology, a, a, a treatment procedure. The treatment procedures consist on mixing um, a clay with a solution containing polymers, and then as a second and important step is the dehydration. First of all, the mixing with uh, water uh, is, improves the intercalation of the polymer between the clay platelets. And then the dehydration expel all the water molecules absorbing the polymer represented here by the blue line irreversibly to the negative surface of the clay through the fixed cations. Um, this passage is crucial to absorb irreversibly, so in the long term, the polymer into the clay. And this is what we claim. Uh, the, the effect of this treatment is to maintain the diffuse double layer open even in presence of uh, electrolyte solutions. And this behavior is maintained in the long term. Okay. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to highlight uh, the methodology that we have used to characterize not only standard clays, but in particular polymerized clays to demonstrate the improved uh, ability of protecting the clay from chemical attack also introducing new methods, uh, not only by ourselves at Hent University, but also in the literature worldwide to represent better the behavior of polymerized clays. Let's start from the material characterization. Um, uh, one of the most common methods uh, to uh, 
characterize a clay are the outer bear limits. The outer bear limits in particular for clays used for barriers, uh, for uh, um, chemical barriers, um, the outer bear limits are useful because the liquid limit, which is one of the outer bear limits, represent the water absorption capacity of a clay and it was demonstrated by Lin and Benson that this parameter is inversely related to the hydraulic conductivity. Therefore, a high liquid limit can give uh, a character, gives a characteristic um, informing us that potentially the clay can have a very low hydraulic conductivity, which is what we want. Viscosity is another important parameter of a clay for different type of applications. Here in the picture, you can see a, a Brookfield viscometer that I have used for, during my PhD. Other methods are also used currently by the other students uh, at uh, our laboratory, like the FAM viscometer, but also the very um, uh, standard and uh, simple uh, marsh funnel uh, test. The viscosity gives an idea of um, the uh, workability uh, of uh, the clay. This kind of parameter is very useful for vertical barriers, for example, for cutoff walls, but also for uh, soil bentonite backfills, uh, in which you need to know this characteristic, um, to know the, 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 the workability, the behavior of uh, the, the, the slurry of clay and uh, water. Uh, there are certain characteristics that have to be fulfilled. For example, also for drilling fluid applications where the slurry of bentonite transport solids. So you need a minimum viscosity to be able for the bentonite to maintain in suspension the solids. But this viscosity should be not too high. Otherwise, during the stop of the work, when you have to mix again, you, you would need too much energy. Another parameter that is normally tested to qualify a clay is the cation exchange capacity. The cation exchange capacity is uh, uh, representing the ability of a clay to exchange its ions, for example, sodium uh, with calcium. So a very high cation exchange capacity is an uh, index of good quality of a clay. Why? Because it represents a very high negative surface neutralized by the sodium cations. On the other hand, um, the high cation exchange capacity means that the same clay, very good quality sodium clay, can be easily damaged due to cation exchange with calcium. Another method to characterize a clay is <laughs> with the XRD uh, methodology. Uh, this I think is a, a quite uh, uh, old equipment used during my PhD, but is still use this methodology with new equipment to represent the, the clay, to distinguish different type of uh, mineralogy of clays. For example, with the XRD, you can recognize if a clay is a kaolinite, an illite, or a montomorillonite. The clay that is normally used for barriers is the bentonite containing a large amount of montmorillonite. And you can use XRD to recognize this type of uh, content of montmorillonite. On the other hand, for polymerized clays, this equipment with this method was also uh, very useful. And we will see this in the next slide. Also, the zeta potential is a method uh, used in my PhD to measure the negative surface of the clay uh, depending on the pH. Let's pass now to some examples of these methodologies. In this slide, you can see an example of the use of XRD to characterize a clay uh, at the left and a hyperclay at the right. You can see in the graph below that increasing the polymer dosage, the distance between the clay platelets increased. This means that the uh, polymer did intercalate within the clay platelets. Uh, we also perform utter bear limits. In particular, here I show the liquid limit test. And we demonstrated that with increasing the polymer dosage, there was an increase of the liquid limit, both in water, calcium chloride, and seawater, indicating a potential improvement of the permeability of the clay 
uh, thanks to polymer addition. Another uh, short te term test um, performed to characterize a clay for a barrier, in particularly for GCLs, geosynthetic clay liners, is the swelling test. A geosynthetic clay liner is a, a liner, a barrier for to isolate uh, polluted sites and uh, in particular landfills, uh, composed of a thin layer, about one centimeter of powder bentonite, uh, or granular bentonite uh, sandwiched between two geosynthetics. And these two geosynthetics sometimes are also very often are needle punched to hold uh, the two geosynthetics together and to avoid uh, that excessive swelling of the GCL would cause uh, shear uh, mechanical problems. The standard swell index test consists on pouring two grams of bentonite in 100 milliliter of a solution. After settlement, you can measure the height of the bentonite. The height of this bentonite represents the ability of the clay to swell. That was, uh, that would cause the dispersed structure we have seen at the beginning. That was, that is uh, what we want. We want a dispersed structure and a low hydraulic conductivity. Uh, for polymerized uh, clays, however, this test uh, showed some limitations. As you can see at the right, the polymerized bentonites often shows a turbid solution. This turbid solution is very probably due to the fact that the polymer maintains uh, the soil in suspension, not contributing to the height of the swell here bentonite therefore uh, producing a false measurement and underestimation of the swell index. For this reason, uh, at Kent University, we de de developed another simple apparatus here, the swell pressure apparatus, that is able to measure the swell pressure of the clay inundated by the solution. The swell pressure apparatus is simply a, an edometer where we pour a, a bentonite power between two porous stones. Then we fix the height with a load uh, cell. And after inundated the clay, inundated the clay with a solution, we measure the pressure of the clay platelets on the load cell. This pressure represents the pressure that the swollen water uh, push between the clay platelets. So the higher this swell pressure, the higher is the possibility to have a dispersed structure, which is what we want, without the limitation of the turbidity of the solution. Uh, another limitation of the swell index test is that in presence of calcium clay, for example, uh, the clay will have a card house structure, as you can see here at the left. Apparently, the clay, the calcium clay, uh, has a high swelling ability, but in the reality, this high height is due to the card house structure. Card house structure means that the edges and uh, the longer uh, edge of the clay uh, touch, but the platelets are not dispersed, they are aggregated with a consequent uh, very large uh, pores, like you can see here, and very large permeability. This is another limitation of the swell index test, and therefore the swell pressure test is more representative, as you can see here in this example. Here in this example, we have a calcium clay with a low swell index, a sodium activated clay, and the hyperclay apparently uh, had a swell index uh, similar or slightly higher compared to the calcium clay. But the calcium clay was just um, flocculated with the card house structure um, and therefore it was not dispersed. With the swell pressure test, we really clearly demonstrated that the pressure uh, of the swollen uh, water between the clay platelets was increased by sodium activation and by hyperclay treatment. Here is an example of what we obtained for uh, the comparison between untreated clay in blue and hyperclay in red. 
as you can see, the swell pressure um, was higher for hyperclay for a series of various uh, solutions. With uh, this uh, um, quality test, we have seen that potentially the polymer treatment of uh, the various clays, in particular with uh, of hyperclay, uh, potentially can have an improved behavior uh, compared to untreated clay. But the real test that we should uh, see is the hydraulic conductivity test. The hydraulic conductivity can be measured as also shown by uh, other presenters, in particular, Professor Sampor Lord, by the permeameters here at the uh, lower right corner, by rigid wall and flexible wall permeameters. Uh, in our laboratory, we had also a large scale permeameter uh, of 30 centimeter diameter that is able to house two samples at the same time. With this permeameter, we were able to test uh, the hydraulic conductivity of overlapped DPH GCLs that you can see here in the picture. As mentioned before, prehydration with water is one of the methods used that is standard. This method is standardly used on site to improve the permeability of a uh, bentonite clay. And uh, the prehydration protect also from chemical attack of the solutions, protect from cation exchange. However, this is in the short term. If we go to the long term, how like shown here by this research of Shackleford and Lee, the uh, hydraulic conductivity after breakthrough of the solution through the thickness of the sample, the hydraulic conductivity will increase. Therefore, the prehydration improvement is only temporary. Uh, with the hyperclay method, we uh, prehydrate the material with the polymer, but then we dehydrate. Therefore, we start with a, a non prehydrated sample, but polymerized. As you can see here, the comparison of the difference between the hydraulic conductivity of an untreated clay and the hyperclay is of one order of magnitude. This permeability is to sea water and it was maintained uh, in the very long term for about 15 years, and it is still uh, running. Here, this decrease of the permeability was due to corrosion of the uh, bladder accumulator. There was a clear uh, cloud of uh, reddish uh, precipitation of, of, the, of the metal, that it was removed, and then the permeability continued to be, to be low. Uh, we also uh, checked the outlet that never showed an illusion of the polymer. The long-term performance of hyperclay was also demonstrated by other methods. And in particular, using the chemical osmotic efficiency test. This uh, chemical osmotic efficiency test was also described by Professor Sampo Lord in her uh, presentation about diffusion and osmotic test. Here in this presentation, we will uh, use this, uh, make use of this methodology to analyze polymerized clays. When you have a waste that has to be confined, the flow can be advective due to the permeability of the solution through the pores, can be diffusive due to the difference of concentration between one side and the other, and the tendency following fixed flow to reach equilibrium. And these two flows are in one direction, from the pollution to the clean water. On the other side, the osmotic flux will go from the drinking water to the, to the polluted site, which is positive, because avoid the spread of the pollution. Let's see why. This is a simple example of how osmotic work, efficiency work. The orange line represents a membrane, an osmotic membrane. The solution at the left represents the polluted solution with a concentration C1 higher than the concentration of the clean water represented at the right by C2. If the orange line has a membrane behavior, 
means that uh, the membrane does not allow the ions to move from the left to the right to create equilibrium between concentrations. Therefore, the equilibrium is reached by moving water from right to left. This is allowed by the membrane, the movement of water. Uh, this water movement creates a differential pressure between the two parts. Um, if you do not allow the water to move, you have to apply a pressure. This pressure is here named delta P. What is osmotic efficiency? Osmotic efficiency is the ratio between this pressure that you have to apply to avoid the movement of water and the ideal delta pi that will be the pressure needed in the case the membrane is perfectly osmotic. That means that there is no passage at all of any ion from one side to the other. In the reality, the membranes are always uh, semi, uh, have always semi-membrane behavior and some ions can pass to the other side. Therefore, delta P is always lower than delta pi and omega is lower than one. Uh, to test polymerized clays, we have used the apparatus uh, shown in the slide. This chemical osmotic apparatus was uh, developed by uh, Malusis and Shackleford uh, in 2003 in the States. We um, uh, replicated the same apparatus to be able to compare um, the same test, but on polymerized clays. The apparatus consists of a cell where there is the sample, the polymerized or untreated clay repre that represent the orange line. And then there are two chambers. At the top, you have a porous stones where you flush the polluted solution. And at the base, you flush the clean solution. You do not allow the movement of the sample and you do not allow the flow of the water. So this is a closed system where you flush the two solutions to allow diffusion. You have also a differential pressure transducer to measure delta P. In this way, you are able to calculate the osmotic efficiency. Let's see the results we obtained with uh, untreated clay um, and treated clays. At the left, you can see the red line represents the osmotic efficiency of an untreated clay. As it was demonstrated by Shackleford and Lee in 2003, the chemical osmotic efficiency of an untreated clay decreases uh, with time due to the diffusion of the solution throughout the clay. The diffusion uh, of the solution throughout the clay um, damage the clay dispersed structure, uh, leading to a destruction of the osmotic efficiency, as you can see here represented by the differential pressure versus time. Uh, we also tested the DPH, GCL, and multisuellable bentonite. And also in that case, the osmotic efficiency that originally was higher than the untreated clay. Uh, throughout the time, the osmotic efficiency was lost, probably because due to elution of the amendments. On the other uh, side, at the right, you can see that the hyperclay showed uh, to maintain the osmotic behavior even in the long term. The reason of this behavior is probably due to the uh, dispersed structure maintained uh, by the presence of the polymer, which is irreversibly adsorbed onto the clay. We demonstrated this, uh, uh, this uh, conclusion also by uh, using a model. We used a model developed by Dominiani et al. and uh, Manassero uh, during uh, the PhD of uh, Andrea Dominiani. We use uh, his model to represent uh, the untreated and treated clays. In this uh, representation of a parametric study uh, using uh, the model of Dominiani, we show that uh, decreasing the number of clayslets per tattoid from the blue to the purple, the chemical osmotic efficiency increases. The shape of the 
uh, curve show also the gradual decrease of the chemical osmotic efficiency uh, with time due to diffusion. Six zero here represent the negative surface of the clay. As mentioned before, the negative surface of the clay um, will uh, lead to a higher swell pressure. So the clay platelets will be pushed apart by this swell pressure and the higher the negative surface, the higher is the possibility to have uh, uh, dispersed structure. Therefore, a low N. N is the number of platelets per tactoid. In this other uh, parametric study, you can see that uh, decreasing the number of platelets per tactoid, the shape of the curve changes from a peak that is increasing and then gradually decreasing, we arrive to a purple line which shows a plateau where there is no gradual decrease of the osmotic behavior where N is equal to one. So it's very dispersed uh, clay. We use these parametric uh, curves to fit the results of our chemical osmotic test on hyperclay. And we found out that the model represents very well the behavior of untreated and treated clay, uh, showing that hyperclay has an, a, a lower number of platelets per tactoid. This same result um, was confirmed by a study of uh, Nicolò Guarena and Dominiani in the, his recent uh, PhD studies, where he showed uh, he did a very broad research on various uh, polymerized clays, and he uh, was able as well uh, with the model to uh, represent the number of platelets per tactoid of the polymerized clays. So he was able during his PhD to further upgrade the model in, uh, and was able to represent the ability of polymerization to change the clay behavior. Okay, uh, until now I have shown the methodologies, uh, the methods used to uh, test uh, polymerized clays and new methods proposed to uh, represent better their behavior compared to untreated clays. Here now I will pass to the second uh, part of the presentation talking about the sustainability uh, of this kind of treatments to create hyperclays in a sustainable manner, I uh, have used a waste product. Uh, for example, dredged sediments. And in the last slides, I will show briefly uh, what we have done um, uh, in terms of sustainability. We have treated dredged sediments with hyperclay technology. We are reusing waste polymers. Uh, we uh, also use hyperclays for different applications. Starting from the dredged sediments. The dredged sediments are the result of maintenance of uh, channels and uh, rivers worldwide. Uh, by dredging them uh, for maintenance reasons, um, a large amount of uh, sediments are produced. These sediments have to be disposed. Uh, it is easy to remove the sand by centrifugation and to reuse the sand, which is clean. But the fine sediments uh, create a problem, an environmental and economical problem. Why? Because being fine, they are difficult to, to be dewatered. So they create very large amount of uh, sediments to be disposed in landfills. And they being fine, having also about 30% of Montemorin lanonite, some of them, uh, they are able to uh, absorb pollution and therefore they are polluted. Uh, in this research, we wanted to improve this behavior. So we treated the dredged sediment with hyperclay behavior and we showed that the hydraulic conductivity decreased considerably uh, up to the level of a bentonite. So treating a dredged sediment with hyperclay procedure uh, changes the dredged sediment to the behavior of a bentonite. We also did some batch sorption test where we demonstrated that the hyperclay method uh, absorb, improve the absorption capacity of a kaolin 
and a dredged sediment, so two low quality uh, materials, uh, to the level of a bentonite behavior, a high quality material, absorbing uh, better the, uh, ca the copper and the lead, for example. For this uh, test, I have used uh, batch sorption tests. Uh, the second point of the list on sustainability was the reuse of waste polymer. Uh, at uh, our laboratory, the PhD student Kisar uh, Khan and a new PhD student uh, Wakas, uh, both from Pakistan, they are studying the possibility to reuse waste polymer from the sewage sludge to uh, decrease the cost of production. On the other hand, there is already a, a research done on this uh, behavior. Um, recently, there was also another PhD discussion I, I was uh, uh, participating of Professor Maria Boscov, uh, her PhD student student uh, showed mixed some soil with waste polymers from sewage sludge uh, to reuse as uh, geotechnical soil, so in general. But in particular, they found out that this sewage sludge containing uh, indeed polymers decreased the hydraulic conductivity of the material. Therefore, we see a very good possibility to reuse this kind of wastes to uh, improve barriers with the polymers contained in the sewage sludge. Uh, in the list, you see also that the polymerized clays can be used to improve uh, vertical walls, cement cutoff walls, or soil bentonite backfills in contact with sulfate. And here I show briefly an equipment we have built at Kent uh, University, where we measure at the same time permeability and uh, stiffness of a cemented soil. The permeability is with the usual permeometer, and the, with the bender elements here that are uh, piezo uh, ceramic plates, we measure the shear wave throughout a cemented soil, which measure the stiffness uh, and therefore the strength as well of the material. Here we also measure the height and we can characterize the impact of sulfate uh, permeation throughout the cemented uh, material. We have seen that a clay, in fact, as uh, also shown in the literature, when permeated with the sulfate solution, um, damage each, its uh, structure. This was a clay mixed with cement for to represent a cutoff wall, a vertical bentonite cut of, uh, so cement cutoff wall. And uh, as usual, um, uh, as expected, the permeability was damaged. However, the hyperclay represented here by the white dots, maintain a very low hydraulic conductivity, even in presence of sulfates. Why? Because the polymerization maintains all cement and clay in suspension, creating a homogeneous structure with, with the small pores, uh, avoiding the late ettringite formation, which is the reason of the damage of the uh, cement uh, the bentonite. Here we show a research uh, with um, um, Professor Malusis in Bucknell University. I was uh, there visiting for a stage where we uh, started some uh, study on soil bentonite backfills using hyperclay. And then we continue with, I came back to Belgium um, uh, um, with um, Dr. Anna Norris. Uh, she was a TC student at that time. And then she uh, also uh, finished uh, uh, her PhD with the Professor Scalia in the University of Professor, where Professor Shackelford uh, is, uh, um, is dean. And um, this is the result of her research. So um, Anna um, tested uh, soil bentonite backfills uh, containing hyperclay here uh, in Belgium uh, during her thesis, master thesis before uh, the, doing her PhD on similar topics. Um, and here she demonstrated that the use of hyperclay for soil bentonite backfills protected the uh, behavior of the soil bentonite backfill by the presence of calcium. Soil bentonite backfills are a mixture of sand bentonite slurries used for vertical walls 
and normally the water is uh, good and convenient to use the water from the site, but the water of the site contains calcium and the calcium, as you have uh, heard during the presentation, destroy uh, the behavior of the clay. Therefore, uh, here it was interesting to see the impact of hyperclay, uh, the use of hyperclay, as, as you can see here, the white dots represent the use of hyperclay in presence of various concentrations of calcium and sodium, and how the hyperclay use maintain a low hydraulic conductivity. Um, Finally, I show the results of the PhD of Michela De Camillis. Uh, she uh, did her PhD at Kent University, and uh, we tested here hyperclay, um, the wet and dry aging of hyperclays. The wet and dry aging is important for clays because it represents the damaging due to the weather, the wet and dry uh, seasons. Uh, and in presence also of ions, uh, the clay is normally destroyed. Um, this was demonstrated also by Boat and Jefferies on untreated clay some years ago. And we wanted to simulate similar behavior with hyperclays. And as you can see here, the use of hyperclays maintain an almost intact structure compared to the uh, untreated clay or to hyperclay treated with a lower amount of polymer. The swelling decreases after some wet and dry cycles with seawater, but the final swelling of hyperclay 8% was comparable to the original swelling of the untreated clay with water, which is the maximum swelling you can expect for, from a clay. Uh, also, the permeability of the hyperclay was lower compared to the untreated clay after wet and dry aging. Uh, Michela also did an analysis in cooperation with the geology department here at Kent University, and she was able to quantify actually the cracks due to wet and dry aging. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, these are the wet and dry uh, the uh, cracks uh, during the, the dry cycle, and then the cracks during the wet cycle. During the wet cycle, the hyperclay here represented by the black uh, rectangular was able to, to see, heal almost all the cracks, whereas the untreated clay showed still uh, the cracks that were not healed. And finally, currently, uh, my PhD student, Kizar Khan, he is performing some soil water retention curve on hyperclays. Uh, soil water retention curves were mentioned, were described by Professor uh, Nasli Yesiler on GCL, geosynthetic clay liners. In particular, here we show the same soil water retention curves uh, procedures with filter paper and humidity sensors methods on hyperclays. As you can see, the black dots represent the hyperclays clays that showed always a higher retention capacity both in dionized water, calcium chloride and seawater compared to the untreated clay, um, showing that there is a possibility that the reason why under wet and dry aging the hyperclay was behaving better is due to the higher, uh, better retention capacity, water retention capacity. Uh, more research is ongoing uh, during the stage of Kisar Khan at Bochum University using also other apparatus, for example, the mirror hygrometer. To conclude, um, during the presentation, I have shown different parameters that can affect the hydraulic conductivity of clays. Uh, which are uh, the uh, densification, the uh, prehydration, uh, the presence of ions of different uh, valence, and the polymer treatment. I have um, briefly explained the various uh, uh, treatment methods uh, uh, that uh, are uh, now available. And uh, finally, I spoken about the possible extra applications of these uh, materials, uh, um, in particularly uh, aiming uh, at the sustainable reuse of dredged sediments and waste polymers. I would like to thank again, uh, Professor Reddy for this invitation and I show here me, my email, please feel free to contact me. I look forward to answer your questions.